mankind has often expressed differences of belief with brutality, and the blood of the martyrs painted the paths of early Christians red. Many saints were beheaded, the most famous being St. John the Baptist, but some beheaded saints are known as cephalophores, a word that comes from the Greek for head carrier, saints pictured holding their own heads. It is a strange and imposing image, the headless person carrying their own head, full of symbolism, an image that translates easily to horror stories and ghostly tales, the headless horseman from the legend of Sleepy Hollow among them. The cephalophoric saints are shown holding their own decapitated heads, usually as a literal reference to their decapitation in life, but the symbolism reflects a defiance against the very ones who cut off their heads and a kind of holy triumph over death itself. Sarah Juliet Lauro, in her article titled The Zombie Saints, The Contagious Spirit of Christian Conversion Narratives, published in Literature and Theology, Volume 26, Number 2, from June 2012, notes that the corpses of saints do the opposite of what normal cadavers do. Instead of smelling putrefied and foul, they often emit a pleasant odor. Instead of causing sickness, the saints' remains can cure all manner of ills, and in many cases, saints' corpses remain incorrupt. They do not decompose as other dead bodies do. It's hard to imagine a more extreme designation of death than decapitation, literally separating the brain, as well as the eyes, ears, nose, and mouth, from the body. As a symbol of death, there may be none more potent than decapitation. Except in science fiction tales, there's no coming back from a beheading. The tales of cephalophoric saints, with their truer legend, present perhaps the best example of the saint's body defying the usual progression of death. The headless saints refuse to lie down and be quiet. Instead, they lift their own heads and, at least for a time, continue through the world of the living. St. Denis, the most famous of the cephalophores, was born in Italy sometime in the 3rd century. The exact date and place of his birth is unknown. When Denis was just a young man, he was already noted for his virtue and faith. Pope Fabian sent Denis to Gaul with a mission to try to restore the church in the region, which had suffered greatly under the Emperor Decius. Denis, along with his companions, Rusticus, a priest, and Aleotarius, arrived in Paris and took up residence on an island in the Seine. Here they also built a church where regular services were held. Denis was known as an effective and inexhaustible preacher and was responsible for converting many. Unfortunately, this aroused the attention of the pagan priests in the area, who became envious and angry. They attempted to turn the populace against Denis and petitioned the governor, Fescenius Sicinius, to stop the Christians by force. St. Denis and his companions were imprisoned and subjected to cruel tortures. Twelve men beat them before they were tightly bound in iron chains. The next day, Denis was stretched naked upon a gridiron, which was placed over burning coals. Dennis sang to God as he was tortured, saying, Lord, thy word is vehemently fiery, and thy servant is embraced in the love thereof. Next, Dennis was thrown to wild animals, who had been starved to make them vicious and hungry. The beast came running, Dennis made the sign of the cross, and the creatures all laid down as if tame. After this, Dennis was thrown into a furnace, but the flames extinguished before he was burnt. Then he was crucified and suffered other tortures as he hanged. Next, Dennis and his companions were thrown in a dark dungeon with other Christians. Undeterred, St. Dennis said Mass for the prisoners. Jesus appeared to Dennis in a great light, bringing bread, and said, Take this, my dear friend, for thy reward is great with me. 
Denis, Rusticus, and Aleatarius were brought for judgment, but they refused to turn from the Holy Trinity, so they were sentenced to death. Each of them was beheaded with an axe, but Denis's body arose, picked up his head, and began walking away. The headless saint walked two miles from Mount Marta, the Hill of Martyrs, where he was decapitated, to his final resting place, the future site of the Abbey of St. Denis. While Dennis was walking, holding his head in his hands, he spoke his last sermon, preaching about repentance. He was led by an angel bearing a great light before him, and it was said a choir of angels could be heard singing as he walked. Around this time, Regulus, the Bishop of Arles, was saying Mass and speaking the names of the apostles and martyrs. He added the names of Dennis, Rusticus, and Eleotarius, which made those present wonder, as news did not travel so swiftly in those days. Everyone thought Dennis and his companions were still alive, preaching in Paris. Three doves descended and sat upon the altar. On each of the birds' breasts was written one of the names of the recent martyrs, Dennis, Rusticus, Aleatarius. All who saw these signs knew it meant that the three men had been martyred. The bodies of Rusticus and Aleatarius were to be thrown into the Seine, but a noblewoman named Catula distracted the pagans and had the martyrs' bodies secreted away and buried in one of her fields. When the Christian persecutions had ended, she had the bodies exhumed and buried again next to St. Denis. A small shrine was erected over their graves, which eventually became a basilica erected by St. Genevieve. It was written that King Clovis dug up St. Denis' remains and removed a bone from his arm. Afterward, it was said, the king went mad. In the year 832, books by St. Denis regarding the hierarchy of angels were brought as gifts to King Louis the Pious. The night the books arrived, nineteen men were said to have been healed in the church of St. Denis. Denis' feast day is October 9th. He is the patron saint of France, Paris, possessed people, and he is the patron against frenzy, headaches, hydrophobia, rabies, and strife. A tale of St. Paul the Apostle from the Golden Legend states that as he was to be decapitated, St. Paul knelt, stretched his neck, and was beheaded. The bodiless head spoke, Jesus Christus, fifty times, and milk poured from his wound before blood flowed. The head of St. Paul was then cast into a valley with the heads of other martyrs and was thought to be lost. A shepherd, however, retrieved the head and placed it upon his staff. For three nights he saw a great light shine upon the head, after which it was thought to be the head of St. Paul. Despite the supernatural light, some still doubted that this was the correct head. However, after it was placed at the feet of St. Paul's corpse, the saint's body turned, grabbed the head, and replaced it upon his shoulders, before settling once again into the stillness of death. Legends state that St. Aphrodisius was a high priest of Heliopolis who sheltered the Holy Family during their time in Egypt. Later, Aphrodisius was informed of the miracles of Jesus from Alexandrian Jews returning from pilgrimage in Jerusalem. Aphrodisius traveled to Palestine in search of the miracle worker and became one of Jesus' disciples. Following the resurrection, Aphrodisius was among the many who received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. After accompanying Sergius Paulus to evangelize in Provence, Aphrodisius made his way to Baziers. Aphrodisius arrived in Baziers on a camel 
and lived for some time as a hermit, making a cave his home. Eventually, he became the first bishop of Bazirs. Aphrodisius' martyrdom came at the hands of a group of local pagans, who beheaded Aphrodisius and kicked his head into a nearby well. The well ejected a geyser-like spout of water, and with it the saint's head. The decapitated Aphrodisius picked up his own head and began to walk through the city. People began to pour snails in his path, but Aphrodisius walked over them with ease, not breaking a single shell. Seven stonemasons began shouting and mocking the headless saint. They received the severe punishment of being turned to stone themselves. There is a street in Bazirs, known as the Street of Heads, where the seven stone heads can still be seen. The headless Aphrodisius continued walking until he reached his old cave, wherein he placed his head. On that spot, a chapel dedicated to St. Peter was built, and later a basilica named for St. Aphrodisius. After his death, Aphrodisius' camel was cared for by a family of local potters. After Aphrodisius was recognized as a saint, the city's leaders took over care for the animal, even providing it with a house. St. Aphrodisius' feast day is April 28th. His relics were carried in procession during times of plague or drought. Roman by birth, St. Lucian was converted to Christianity by Peter the Apostle. Lucian preached in Italy following St. Peter's death. After receiving the request by Pope St. Clement to preach in the West, St. Dionysius gathered several Christians to help with this mission, Lucian among them. Lucian ended up in Belgium with his companions Maximilian and Julian. Lucian was a convincing preacher converting many pagans by both his speech and by the example of his life. Lucian was known to be pleasant and cheery, always with a kind face and a kind word, though he himself was a strict ascetic. He ate only a small morsel of bread each day and drank only water. The Roman Emperor Domitian initiated the second Christian persecution, requiring all persons to offer sacrifice to the Roman gods. Torture and execution awaited all who defied this order. Three Roman officials were sent to Belgium to enforce the emperor's order. Lucian was given precognition of these events by God, and gathering the local Christian population, he urged them to remain faithful and strong, not to fear torture or death, but instead to be thankful for joining the ranks of the martyrs. Roman soldiers soon arrived and took Julian, Maximian, and Lucian away to trial. Julian and Maximian refused to renounce Christ and were beheaded. Lucian was interrogated and accused of sorcery and disobedience to the Roman emperor. Lucian replied that he was no sorcerer, but a servant of the true God, Jesus Christ. Lucian was led away and subjected to brutal beatings, to which he replied, Never will I cease to praise Christ, the Son of God, in my heart and with my lips. Next, Lucian was decapitated, but as his head fell, a light from heaven shined upon his body. The voice of Jesus was heard calling Lucian to heaven, where he would receive the martyr's crown. The saint stood up, picked up his own head, and started walking. He crossed a river and continued to the place he had chosen for his burial, before he lay down in death. A church was built over St. Lucian's grave, and the relics of St. Maximian and St. Julian were brought there. St. Lucian's feast day is January 8th. He is the patron saint of Beauvais. Not too much is known about St. Valerie of Limoges. She was supposed to have lived during the 3rd century. 
She was a virgin converted to Christianity by Bishop St. Marshall. When St. Valerie was martyred and beheaded, she carried her own head, placing it before St. Marshall. St. Valerie's feast day is December 9th. She is the patron saint of Limoges. St. Minus was the first Christian martyr of Florence. In 250 AD, Minus was brought before Emperor Decius. During the Decian prosecution, people were being asked to make sacrifices and devotions to the Roman gods. Minus declined and was subjected to various tortures. First, he was thrown into a raging furnace, then pelted with stones. Next, he was thrown to a lion at an amphitheater. From all of these torments, Minus returned unharmed. Finally, Minus was beheaded, but he picked up his head, crossed the Arno River, and returned to his hermitage, what is now known as St. Minus Hill in Florence. St. Minus Feast Day is October 25th. St. Eustace of Beauvais was born in France during the year 278 amidst the Diocletian persecution. At the age of nine, St. Eustace accompanied his father, Justin, to Amiens to pay the ransom on Justinian, Justin's brother, who was being held as a slave. When they reached Amiens, Lupus, the man who enslaved Justinian, said that if they could identify Justinian, Lupus would allow them to pay the ransom and Justinian could go free. However, when the group of slaves were brought out, neither brother recognized the other. St. Eustace, however, even though he had never seen his uncle, identified him correctly, pointing out Justinian, who was holding a lamp and crying, That is he. So Justinian's freedom was purchased. A soldier who witnessed this event, however, went to the Roman governor of the region and reported that there were Christian magicians in town. Four soldiers were sent to hunt them down and bring them back, or to kill them if they would not come quietly. The three Christians were sitting by a spring when St. Eustace saw four riders approaching. Justin and Justinian hid in a nearby cave and asked the young boy to put the soldiers off. When the soldiers rode up to St. Eustace, they asked him to what gods he made sacrifices. St. Eustace replied that he was a Christian, after which he was immediately beheaded by one of the soldiers. Before they could collect his head, however, the body of St. Eustace picked it up and held it before them. Standing upright, the now headless saint spoke, Lord of heaven and earth, receive my soul, for I am sinless. At this sight, the soldiers fled in fear. When St. Eustace's father and uncle emerged from the cave to find him holding his own head, the young saint instructed them further. He said that his body was to be buried in the cave, but his head was to be taken to his mother. St. Eustace said, If she wants to see me again, she must look for me in heaven. St. Eustace's feast day is October 18th. St. Felix and St. Regula were brother and sisters and members of the Theban Legion, an entire Roman legion that converted to Christianity and were martyred together in 286 AD. Felix and Regula fled before the mass execution and made it to Zurich before they were caught, faced trial, and executed by decapitation. The two saints then picked up their own heads, walked forty paces uphill, kneeled, and prayed before finally dying. They were buried where they fell.
The site of their burial is where the Grossmunster stands today. St. Felix and St. Regula share the feast day of September 11th. They are the patron saints of Zurich. St. Nicasius, whose birth date is unknown, was Bishop of Rons in the early 5th century. It was said that St. Nicasius gave prophecy of the invasion of France in the year 407 by the Vandals. He notified the populace of the coming invasion in order that they could prepare themselves. When the people asked St. Nicasius if they should fight, he replied, Let us abide the mercy of God and pray for our enemies. I am ready to give myself for my people. When the Vandals came to the gates of the city, St. Nicasius attempted to slow the progress in order to allow more civilians to escape. The barbarians later found St. Nicasius in his church, along with his lector, Jacundus, his deacon, Florentius, and his virgin sister, Eutropia, who were all martyred by the Vandals. St. Nicasius was at the altar reciting Psalm 119. He was decapitated as he spoke the line, My soul is attached unto dust. His head fell, but continued speaking the psalm, Revive me, Lord, with your words, even after falling to the ground. Other references tell similar stories of St. Nicasius. However, the invading force was said to be the Huns, in the year 451. These same sources note that, before the invasion, St. Nicasius survived a bout of smallpox. One prayer for St. Nicasius' intercession went, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the Lord protect these persons, and may the work of these virgins ward off the smallpox. St. Nicasius had the smallpox, and he asked the Lord to preserve whoever carried his name inscribed. O St. Nicasius, thou illustrious bishop and martyr, pray for me, a sinner, and defend me by thy intercession from this disease. Amen. St. Nicasius' feast day is December 14th. He is the patron saint of smallpox victims. Born sometime in the 7th century, St. Asith was a martyred nun from Mercia, England. The daughter of a Mercian chief, St. Asith was raised in a nunnery, possibly at Aylesbury, and desired to become a nun herself. However, she was promised in marriage to Syra, the king of the East Saxons. Syra was known for his love of hunting, and after the wedding, when attempting to embrace St. Asith against her will, he was distracted by a beautiful white stag, which he immediately pursued. When he returned, he found St. Asith had fled. She made her way to the bishops of East Anglia. Syra realized that it was better to have no wife than a wife who was married against her will, and consented to St. Asith becoming a nun. Syra himself gifted St. Asith the land on which she built a monastery. One legend of St. Asith states that she was charged by St. Edith with delivering a book to St. Madwena's nunnery in Northumbria. To get to this place, St. Asith had to cross a bridge over a rough and swollen stream. Due to high waters and harsh winds, St. Asith fell from the bridge and drowned in the waters below. When St. Asith did not return for three days, St. Edith and St. Madwena became concerned and started to search for her. They found her body in the water near the bank of the stream. St. Edith and St. Madwina prayed over her body and commanded St. Asith to rise from the waters. At this, St. Asith returned to life. Later, Danish invaders attacked St. Asith's monastery, and as they were trying to carry her off, she put up such a fight that they cut off her head. 
Some stories place the site of St. Ossus' decapitation at a holy spring in Quarendon. In either case, the decapitated saint was said to have picked up her own head, after which she carried it to the door of a local convent, where she collapsed. The feast day of St. Ossus is October 7th. St. Gines de la Hara is shrouded in mystery. It was thought that he lived around the 9th century. He may or may not be the same as St. Gines of Arles, who shares the same feast day. Several legends exist around the remains of St. Gines. One states that his coffin was sent back to France, but when it arrived, his remains had been miraculously transported back to Spain. Yet another states that St. Gines was martyred in Arles, but after decapitation, his head was taken by the angels to Cartagena, Spain. In the third legend, St. Gines was decapitated in southern France, after which he picked up his own head and threw it into the Rhone River. St. Gines' head was carried out to sea and eventually found its way to the coast of Cartagena. St. John's feast day is August 25th. He is the patron saint of Cartagena, vinters, and agricultural laborers. Sailors were known to ask for St. John's intercession during storms. St. Edmund, the martyr, was the king of East Anglia in the 9th century during the Viking invasions of England. The invaders captured Edmund, who was beaten with rods, tied to a tree, and whipped. Between each lash of the whip, Edmund cried out his belief in Jesus Christ. Enraged, the Vikings next shot arrows into Edmund, until they covered his body like the bristles of a hedgehog. Still Edmund called out to the Lord. The Vikings then dragged Edmund behind them, the king still calling the name of Jesus, until finally his head was cut from his body. The Vikings threw Edmund's head into some brambles, hoping it would not be found and buried with his body. Edmund's people came to collect the king's remains, but they could not find his head. Some days passed. A wolf was assigned by God to guard Edmund's head from other predators. The people continued searching for the king's head and began calling all through the woods, Where are you, friend? Edmund's head answered, Here, 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 and continued to answer their calls until they came upon the large gray wolf sitting with Edmund's head between its forepaws. They carried Edmund's head back to the settlement, and the wolf followed behind, as if it was tame, until they reached the edge of town when the wolf turned and fled back into the woods. Edmund's head and body were reunited, and the king was buried. His grave became a place of pilgrimage and miracles. After the Viking invasion ceased and there was peace, a church was erected at the place of Edmund's burial and his body was exhumed to be placed in the church. Edmund's body was found to be incorrupt. His head and body were rejoined, and he appeared as he had in life. Edmund's body was cared for by a widow named Oswin, who would trim the saint's hair and nails each year. Gifts of gold and silver were brought to honor the saint. A group of eight burglars came to rob St. Edmund's Church of the Treasures. But as each plied the tools of their trade to attempt to gain entry, they were bound and frozen in place. And so they were found in the morning, one in the act of digging under the door with a spade, another was still upon a ladder at the window. Yet another was found in the act of hammering the door hasps, and so on. 
the eight burglars were sentenced to be hanged on the gallows. A wealthy man named Leivstan came to St. Edmund's tomb and demanded to see the incorrupt body for himself. Leivstan was an unbeliever, arrogant and insolent. When he was shown the saint's body, Leivstan instantly went mad, ranting and raving until his death. Many kings would come to visit the tomb of St. Edmund, and so many miracles have been credited to his intercession that entire texts were written on St. Edmund's miracles alone. St. Edmund's feast day is November 20th. He is the patron saint of kings, wolves, torture victims, and those suffering from plague or pandemic. The saints featured in this show were not the only cephalophoric saints, and I'm sure I will come upon more as I do research for the podcast. I'd like to thank the new patrons for The Flowered Path, John Amity and Ando Brisbane. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed The Flowered Path and would like to help support this podcast, you can become a patron at Patreon, patreon.com slash thefloweredpath. Please make sure to subscribe to The Flowered Path wherever you are listening, share the shows on social media, and leave us a nice review if you feel inclined to do so. My sources for this episode can be found in the show notes at thefloweredpath.com. You can find The Flowered Path on Facebook, facebook.com slash thefloweredpath, on Instagram, at thefloweredpath, on YouTube, search for The Flowered Path, and please subscribe to the channel and on the web at thefloweredpath.com.